warmer because there's less air circulation as well. Ooh. So it feels kind of stuffy. Kind of cooler yet warmer. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. And the other thing I noticed is that almost every time he gets up, he stretches. Ooh. Cool. That's what was that second one? Every time the dog gets up, he stretches. Aha. Uh -huh. Good one. I've seen that. Well, it's just that everyone, when they came in, you know, the sun is right here. You know, you automatically move, readjust yourself to be a little bit cooler. Uh huh. Cool. What else? I was noticing pockets of really droopy plants and less droopy plants. I haven't been spent enough time around here to know where all the sun patterns was are, but the droopiest plants were in the spot that had sun on it right then. So it was definitely some droopy plants. And I also noticed a cool breeze as as you walk out of the tent and stand in that shady area. So just noticing else. Did you notice something, Rosina? Yeah, and this is something someone pointed out to me years ago about how the leaves don't compete with each other. They all position themselves to catch the sun without blocking the next leaf too badly. Uh-huh, uh-huh. They layer themselves up that way. Yeah, yeah, leaves are basically solar panels for nature. Mm -hmm. And the other pattern is I can't go long without talking to somebody if, if it's quiet. <laughs> it's a, good, a good thing to notice. I think the, the most effective organizations, whether it's a company or a volunteer organization, really make most of the of the characteristics of their members instead of trying to, to squish them down. Like, oh, that Rosita, she's always talking. Oh, good. Let's put her in front of the group. <laughs> Wind her up. Let her talk. <laughs> so, just a little bit of observation. And uh, you can go home and, and do that today. How many people have observed already certain sun patterns on your house or apartment balcony. Lots, you know, you guys are plugged in. And water flow? Anybody have a river on your land? What's that? That's why I'm here. I've got a water flow issue. <laughs> Something running onto your property? Yes. From other? Yeah. Um, are you familiar with Brad Lancaster's Rainwater Harvesting book? I know. Also sold here at the Natural. Gardener. <laughs> this, Brad Lancaster talks about run on, how water running onto your property is a real blessing. You use mulch and swales and all kinds of ways to catch it. It's a, it's a prize. Brad and his brother live in Tucson, Arizona, and they actually make curb cuts and catch water that is just running through the street. They catch it onto their land and water their fruit trees with it. So anything can be a resource. Is it okay to pass these around, Rosina? Sure. Okay. You bet. And I just wanted to remind you, if, if there is feedback that happens that I won't be able to run up fast enough, you can just press that button. <laughs> or run away. <laughs> run over here. There's a pattern. Feedback. <laughs> and a pattern for me is, get excited about talking and totally forget what I just remembered. Yeah. Oh, and I, another pattern, I always forget to introduce myself. My name is Jenny Nazak, and uh, I talk about permaculture. So, okay. Now, another, another really key thing in permaculture, you've got your patterns. What you also want to do is see the solution in a problem. Like, find something good about a problem. So one of the famous examples by Bill Mollison, uh, who's one of the co-founders of permaculture. Permaculture was co-founded. Does anyone know who, who started permaculture? It was a couple of Australian guys back in the 1970s, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. And I believe that is David Holmgren's book over there, Permaculture Way, Permaculture Principles. All right, Vanna, come on down. Anyway, so Bill Mollison, when, you know, when, when he saw someone's property overrun with snails, he said, you don't have a snail problem, you have a duck deficiency. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is an example of reconnecting, you know, getting out of this disconnect. It's the disconnect. We see something, it's like, oh, we've got to get rid of that, that's a problem. Um, conventionally, oh, there's water, there's water here, that's a problem, we've got we to gotta drain it off. And, you know, the city or the county or whatever will work really hard to make sure that all that 
pesky water gets drained away. And meanwhile, like we could use some of that pesky water. And so permaculture is a lot about, about closing these loops. Instead of water, we use water here, send it down the drain, it goes there. Start to close the loop, keep that water on your land. Um, same with, same with uh, food waste, you know, compost it, keep it on your land, enrich the soil. How many people are <coughs> composting? <coughs> right. Vermiculture. How many other people are getting into the vermiculture? All right. My worms died. They died? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what happened? I think I got, I don't really know. It happened a little while ago, and it seemed like everything was fine, and then one day they were kind of just all gone. Right. I, don't know. I think that maybe they fried. I didn't. I mean, I've been putting water on. Well, it. usually no to go underneath. No, I wonder if some fire ants got them. I have an ant problem. I have. Mm. I don't know what the solution is, but I do have an ant yeah. problem. So that may have what it is. Earth. Nematodes. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was that? Birds. Herbs. Birds. Birds. Oh, for the. The for the worms. Well, they're covered. So yeah, covered. I wonder. It may have been the ants, though. The ant problem is it's it's somewhere not outside. enough water. Oh, oh no. And, and so somewhere... It see, was my first time. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. I think a lot of times what we don't realize as modern-day humans, we're used to have, you know, being able to fix things pretty quickly. Like, find an expert, fix it. Read a book, fix it. And back in the day, people spent a lot of time talking about these issues and exchanging information. Like, you know, you'd say to your neighbor, man, my worms died, how are your worms doing? Your neighbor would say, oh, mine are fine. Oh, what's the difference? What are the differences between our worm bins? What are you feeding yours? What am I feeding mine? Nowadays, okay, our neighbor might not even raise any worms and wouldn't ha certainly wouldn't have time to sit around exchanging worm tips. <laughs> so, <laughs> disconnection, it's more that disconnection. So with permaculture, um, fortunately, permaculture takes sort of old-fashioned common sense that our grandparents practiced, and we also use appropriate technology. So we have the internet, we have virtual communities, we have lots of resource sharing. There is a worldwide permaculture email list where you know you could be sharing word tips with people who are trying to raise worms in the Dead Sea, you know, you could, you could be learning, you could be learning from people all over the world. So we can use technology and we have the full menu of best practices from cultures around the world, not only today, but in history, you know, all in the form of, of our libraries and the virtual libraries on the internet. So it's kind of like we've tried all these different things throughout history, we've practiced different steps of the dance, and now we can try to try to put it all together. We have a lot of information. Permaculture, above all else, is information science. It's, it's human information science. Basically, um, the, the weather, the climate, the, the characteristics of your site, whether your site is a little apartment balcony or whether your site is acreage in the country, um, all the physical limitations that we experience are nothing compared with what our imaginations can do. Um, we can use, I'm going to be talking about some more permaculture design principles, we can create microclimates that have a bigger effect on your piece of property. That they, can have, they can practically override the prevailing climate. Um, right now, in Scotland, I mean, you guys probably won't get very excited about this when the temperature is 100 million degrees, but in Scotland, they are growing uh, lemons in greenhouses, in triple glazed greenhouses in Scotland. And actually, they're starting to do pit greenhouses where part of the greenhouse is underground. And so in places like Nepal, where the growing season is like three months and it's like 20 degrees below zero the rest of the time, they're actually being able to grow vegetables year-round. So to start having an influence on our climate, um, here in Texas, you know, on, on a farm, they'll start their lettuces, try to start their lettuces as early as they can, you know, as it's still the blazing summer, but you put a shade house over it. And a shade house can be shade cloth, or it can be branches and brush, you know, start to, we can start to influence our climate. So, microclimate, seeing solutions and problems, 
Um, one thing, one really important in permaculture, I'll start, I'll erase this. Has everybody written all this down? Good. It's going to go goodbye. Really important things in our current way of design that we don't have a lot of, we don't have a whole lot of redundancy. Redundancy. 